Today's scripture, 1 Kings chapter 3, verses 5 through 12. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I shall give you. And Solomon said, You have shown great and steadfast love to your servant David, my father, because he walked before you in faithfulness, in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart toward you. And you have kept for him this great and steadfast love, and have given him a son to sit on his throne this day. And now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of David my father, although I am but a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in. And your servant is in the midst of your people whom you have chosen, a great people, too many to be numbered or counted for multitude. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to govern this your great people? It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this. And God said to him, Because you have asked this, and have not asked for yourself long life or riches or the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right, behold, I now do according to your word. Behold, I give you a wise and discerning mind, so that none like you has been before you, and none like you shall rise after you. Good morning. We'll make sure the mic settles into a proper level for everybody. I'll do my best to speak loudly so that all can hear. It's really good to be with you here again, and I'm so happy to see so many people here. For a minute there, I thought I was at Costco. So, is everyone enjoying their summer? I see the heat finally showed up. So far, my summer's been pretty good. But before we get started, I want to share you a little summer story. My niece from Ontario is in town with her children, visiting her mom, who is my sister. They gave me a call to ask if they could come and visit with Paula and me. They wanted to have a barbecue with us. Hot dogs were suggested under the guise of, I hear you make a good hot dog. But I know it was their effort to help keep the visit simple. We love having them come to visit. It's always a great time. The suggestion of hot dogs was a great idea, but of course, Paul and I can't just serve hot dogs, even if that's all you want. Oh no, thanks for trying to keep it simple, but that's not how it works for us. We must elevate the hot dog. Which hot dog is best? Which bun? What should we have for sides? How many sides? How much of everything should we have? What do we have for dessert? Will they have fun? Will this be a good time? We can't let them down. Paul and I make our list and narrow it down to the right menu. And yes, I said menu. We decided on hot dogs served on brioche buns, potato salad, and a nacho dip for an appetizer. Oh, and then there's the condiments. Ketchup, mustard, sweet relish, corn relish, raw onions, garlic aioli, smoky bacon mustard, hot peppers, and mayo. The final detail, should we toast the buns? For dessert, we have a choice of ice cream sandwiches, chocolate popsicles, or fudgesicles. We stocked up on various soft drinks. On the day of the barbecue, Two Saturdays ago, as usual, there's a moment of panic. Do we have enough? Oh, this is a terrible spread of food. What were we thinking? We need to add more. Suddenly, Doritos are being pulled from the cupboards. We're wondering if we can thaw some hamburger in time. Should we make a Caesar salad? Oh, wait, do we have wings? Anyone close to us knows these panic moments to be true. And I wish I could claim that rationale prevails when the panic sets in and we stick to the actual plan. 
instead of unloading our entire pantry. Just to be clear, none of the effort we go through is designed to impress. The effort is put in so that it can be a meaningful experience for all involved. We want you to feel welcome. I'm happy to say that wisdom prevailed this time and we've decided to stick to the plan. We trusted the hot dog. I'm telling you this story because it dawned on me as we were preparing for the visit and the barbecue that I was going through the exact same process when I was planning to speak today. What am I going to serve? Is it going to be good enough? Is there plenty? Maybe there's too much. What if you don't like it? So, since wisdom prevailed for the hot dog, I'm trusting the same wisdom with what I have to serve you today. Here's hoping you enjoy the hot dog. I've titled my message, Speaking Words of Wisdom. Now this title is not to imply the words I'm speaking today are 100% wisdom, though that is my sincere hope and prayer. The title is to imply the method to be able to speak words of wisdom. I want to show you a way to understand and, the, and apply the knowledge we have. The Bible is full of verses on wisdom. I'll just make sure everything's working properly. So the Bible is full of verses on wisdom. Wisdom is the easiest thing to look up in the Bible, but also, but also the toughest thing for us to grasp. James tells us in his letter that if any one of us lacks wisdom, we should just ask God. Well, I'm thinking we should do that right now. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this wonderful day and these wonderful people. And thank you for the opportunity for us to share together, to think about you, to talk to you, and to encourage one another with words from you. So bless this message. Bless everyone here. And Father, may we grow together with you. In Jesus' name, amen. What we're going to talk today about is a little bit about Solomon. Then we are going to talk a little more about Jesus and then finish up with talking a little bit more, a little bit of us. So Solomon... Solomon was the king, was the son of King David. Sorry, I'm going to get my rhythm here properly. Solomon was the third king of Israel. Some may even say he was the last king of Israel, given that Israel split into two kingdoms after Solomon. When Solomon took the throne, he was very young. In today's scripture reading, Solomon refers to himself Yes, that's what it's right. I'm sorry, folks. Be thankful I'm nervous because that tells you I don't take you for granted. But he refers to himself as a very young child. I am but a little child. There is no definitive record as to his actual age when he took the throne. Depending on which resource you read, Solomon could have been as young as 12 or as old as 24. Regardless, Solomon was either very young or very, very young when he became king. Solomon had big shoes to fill. He was succeeding King David. The nation of Israel was strong and prosperous. The government was well established. So this should have been an easy transition for Solomon. 
His government was filled with advisors well-educated in the law, military strategy, finances, history, and in religious practices. But for some reason, Solomon seemed nervous. Despite all these resources, Solomon's prayer was for God to give him the wisdom to know right from wrong. Right from wrong? Wouldn't the law tell him that? You would think the religious practices should be able to tell him right from wrong, wouldn't you? Clearly, Solomon was not going to rely solely on the resources of his government, and he certainly wasn't going to trust himself. He was very young, and he didn't even think himself smart enough to find the door to a room. Now he is sitting in the highest office of the nation that God built. What's a person to do? Possibly as young as 12 years old, Solomon knew to ask for wisdom from the one who built his nation. If anyone lacks wisdom, ask God. As we follow the rest of his story, we learn that he wisely applied the laws and practices to govern the people. Remember the split baby story, right? The Bible tells us that Solomon spoke 3,000 wise sayings. This sounds like an exaggeration, or at the very least, a rounded number. But in the same scripture about his wise saying, we also learn, we also learn that he wrote 1,005 songs. Clearly somebody was counting. Let's talk about I'm going to forsake the PowerPoint for a moment, folks, because there's something out of sync here that I don't understand. Let's talk about Jesus. That's what we need to understand. I did say we would talk a little more about Jesus, and I do mean just a little, because as the Apostle John said, if we wrote down all there is to tell about Jesus, the whole world couldn't contain the books. So again, Jesus. Jesus is described as the son of David and the king of Israel. What do we know about Jesus at 12 years old? Let's look at Luke 2, 41 to 52. It's a long one. Bear with me. For your reading pleasure. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up according to the custom. And when the feast was ended, as they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it. But supposing him to be in the group, they went a day's journey. But then they began to search for him among their relatives and acquaintances. And when they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem, searching for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And he said to them, Why are you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And they did not understand the saying he spoke to them. And when he went down with them and came to Nazareth, he was submissive to them. And his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom, in stature, in favor with God and man. This story is quite amazing. But first of all, 
to all of you who have ever doubted, this proves it. Absolutely, home alone can happen. This incident was not, this incident was not an overnight event. As the scripture says, his parents traveled a day's journey before they even realized he wasn't with them. It would take another day to just get back to Jerusalem, to start looking for him there. That's two days already. Then it took another three days to find him. That's five days. Can you imagine the panic in their hearts? Now that's crazy enough to dwell on, but there's more. The implication of the scripture is that Jesus was in the temple reasoning, discussing, and teaching the teachers for five days, and they were astonished at his understanding of the scriptures for five days. He was only 12. I'm doing my best to hold you here for 20 minutes. When his parents found him and asked why he had done this, he didn't say, well, you know, we got separated, so I decided to explore Jerusalem a bit and then ended up in the temple and chatted up the teachers. No, he said, why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I would be in my father's house? Like somehow this was going to make complete sense to his parents. I like the next part of the story. You see right here. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. So clearly, he never tried this again. You can almost see Jesus quickly recalling the fifth commandment at this point and realizing, based on the panic of his parents, that this isn't a commandment with promise after all, but rather a commandment with warning. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God has given you. But in other words, honor your mom or dad or they'll kill you. As Solomon prayed to God for wisdom, we know Jesus prayed too. We do have record of some of what Jesus prayed, but my point today is that Jesus prayed so much that it made his disciples believe they didn't even know what prayer was anymore. We are talking about young Jewish men who grew up in Judea. Trust me, they would have seen and heard prayer. However, when they saw how Jesus prayed, all they knew before was now gone. So far gone that they thought they had to start again by saying, teach us to pray. So what's with all the prayer? Look at the throne Jesus was taking. Solomon was nervous to take the throne of Israel, the throne of a people and a nation God built. Jesus sits on the throne of the universe that God created. Let's look at Jesus with the teachers again. Once again, he is in a crowd and they were all astonished. However, they still thought they would try and stump him. So they pull out all the stops and send in a lawyer. Someone who really knows the law and knows right from, law, right from wrong. Well, the lawyer winds up and says, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment? Now this guy thinks he's going to debate Jesus on which is law is greatest. He apparently wasn't there that day when he was 12 years old. I mean, just picture Jesus there. What's that expression? Hold my drink. Jesus, who is well prayed, responds on just what, it, and responds not just with an answer, but with support and conclusion. He says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is, is the great and first commandment. And a, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. 
on these two commandments, all the prophets and laws rest. That was Jesus talking to the lawyer. So now I'm thinking, it was likely a Jewish lawyer that coined the phrase, oh yeah? And yet, in another legal showdown, we see the wisdom of Jesus in the matters of right and wrong. When he says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. These you ought to have done. Not neglecting the others, you blind guides, straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. How often do we labor, debate, and struggle with the little itty-bitty issues and neglect the greater issues that are out there? We attack our political leaders over random issues, but neglect prayer and praying for our leaders. We hold up placards for social change and neglect to love our neighbors. Well, that brings us finally to the us point of the message. Now, I say us loosely, and so I want to protect all of you from allegation and change the word us to me. But just in case any of you are anything like me, keep listening. What can I take from the example of Solomon? How do I become more Christ-like by following the example of Jesus? Quite honestly, I feel very far from these examples. I'm not the son of David, whether it be literal or figurative. At the age of 12, I certainly wasn't in line for any throne. Well, unless you count the bathroom. I do have six older brothers and sisters. Brothers weren't so bad, but sisters, good luck with that abdication. I was raised on the Bible. I loved Sunday school. I really do believe that the Bible is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I wish we all did. I have held the Bible in high regard my whole life. That, make, that makes me sound really good, right? Be careful. Trust me. I've made many mistakes and bad decisions. In fact, I'm pretty sure I only need one more bad decision and then I'll own the whole set. There's an old Christian song from 1982 called The Swordsman. It begins, When I was young, I was given a sword, told to put it to use, just a child turned loose. Not knowing better, I took everything on, picked a fight with the evening, shook my fist at the dawn. But then I was shown from where the sword came. This describes my early days quite well. I was taken to church when I was five years old, given my first Bible. It was fantastic. Stories, stories, trivia, Bible drills. I was king of the hill. But no matter how many memory verses I knew, details of stories, or where in the Bible I could find it, without knowing its purpose, it can amount to meaninglessness. Thankfully, about 10 years later, I was shown from where the Bible came. It changed my life and gave me a brand new respect for the Bible. You know, that's actually quite a fun story. But, like I said, I have to close the pantry. So we'll move on. The Bible is an intimate letter from God to me, us. If I do not recognize the intimacy written into it for me, us, by the one who wrote it, I will use it incorrectly every time. I will not be able to understand it and 
it can be quite dangerous in my hands. Like Solomon, I need to ask God to show me how to discern right from wrong, even though it may be written right in front of me. And even more to be like Jesus. I need to pray. I need to talk to the author. I need to know his heart so I can effectively share his words. You know, I'm not troubled when unbelievers speak negatively about the Bible. It doesn't bother me. In fact, I expect it. What, you know, the, that's normal. But I am saddened when I hear believers speak disparagingly about the Bible or who are clearly using it incorrectly. We can't do that. We can't. I understand that there can be some confusion with what's written in the Bible, but if any of us are lacking wisdom, ask God. He wrote it. I think to myself today speaking to you guys, and any one of you can leave this place today and quote something I say. And depending on who you quote that to, they're either going to have a good impression of me or a bad impression of me because they're hearing it from you. But I challenge you to go and quote me to somebody who knows me and try to say, this is what Dave meant to somebody who knows me. Because that person who knows me will either say, oh yeah, that's right, or they'll say, whoa, you got Dave all wrong. Think about God. We quote scripture to people like it has some sort of impact in their life because we believe it. Again, you look at Jesus. Again, I agree, he was talking to the Pharisees. They should have known, and that's why he was bringing correction to their understanding of Scripture. But folks, don't go out and judge people when you don't even know to love God with your whole heart. Don't go out and judge people if you don't even know to love your neighbor first. I'm not saying that we can just let sin and not ever say, God, please redeem us. But what I am saying is there are weightier things that if we get right, you'd be surprised at how fast the less weightier things start to come in line. That's all my su suggestion is here. And as a believer, I do hold the Bible in high regard. It's a light for my path. I do lift it up to shine it on the elements of our society always hoping to improve things. But for some reason, when this happens, it can seem to not be enough. Like there is something missing. So when I began, so I begin elevating other things to help shine the light. Like law, and wealth, and politics, and justice. Perhaps it's, there is a lag. relationships? Are we elevating those next to the Bible? Say, well, you know, God would want me to have this relationship. You know, maybe the Bible's got it wrong. Perhaps it's just simply something so plain and simple as pleasure. I mean, but then we elevate religion, and before you know it, all these things are shining their light on the Bible and how we understand the Bible this is not a good thing. So what could be missing that can help me rely on the Bible once again to shine a light on the elements of society? Well, let me tell you, it's not a what. It's a who. Let's start again with the Bible. Okay? Yes, it's definitely a light for my path when the PowerPoints were light from my path. This is not an incorrect statement. However, as I said, it doesn't matter how many Bible verses I know or details of stories. Think about 1 Corinthians 13, 1. If I speak in tongues of men and angels, but have not love, 
I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. I'm just noise. That's it. We're just noise. So you can say all the right words, but if you neglect to love the Lord your God with all your heart, and you neglect to love your neighbor, wow, that's an awfully loud noise. So where were we? Hmm. Oh, right, the Bible. In order for the Bible to shine its light properly, we need to have Jesus shine his light on his word. We need to know the author. We need to have Jesus shine his light on the word. Until we know and understand why the Bible exists, it's nothing more than a weapon in the wrong hands. But once we know where it came from, the words become life. We, can, we then truly know that every scripture is God-breathed. We live to transform lives, not laws. We are not supposed to waver from one popular ideology to the next. We are meant to follow Jesus. We are not meant to defend religion, but we are meant to be Christ-like. Whoa. So last weekend at the barbecue, Oh, apologize, excuse me. So like last weekend at the barbecue, I stand here a little panicked that I haven't served you enough today. Apparently the presentation was a little shaky too. Maybe there was another condiment I should have put out today just to give a little extra flavor. But for now, the pantry is closed. There are so many things we can talk about. Thankfully though, Today we got to talk about Solomon, a little bit more about Jesus, and then, well, us, me. Solomon had all the writings and advisors at his command, but he still asked God to teach him right from wrong. Jesus, the Son of God, God himself, diligently prayed and gushed wisdom. As for me, me, maybe there are enough of you out there today that are like me, that I can actually say us again. If any of us lack wisdom, ask God. Ask him to teach us right from wrong. And then, Pray some more. So if you want to be speaking words of wisdom, it's vitally important that you know from where it comes. I hope you enjoyed your hot dog today. But for now, I'll let it be.